In this episode of Kerbal Gets Real Redux, we are going to be exploring the dawn of human spaceflight, or more really Kerbal spaceflight, as it is Kerbal Space Program. The year is 1960, and two brave pioneers are ready to undergo training for their most exciting mission yet, getting to space and not falling back down to Earth. We'll also be seeing a multitude of other launches over the course of this episode, including our first trip to Mars, as well as an attempt at landing on the surface of the moon. And I said Kerbal Spaceflight, but really I am playing in Realism Overhaul with real scale solar systems, so everything is real life sizes, so I guess this would kind of work for human spaceflight as well just putting it out there. Anyway, the first launch of this episode on the 29th of January 1960, we're in a new decade now, is going to be Rad 4. At the end of the last episode, I unfortunately was unable to complete the Cherenkov radiation experiment because I flung my probe into planetary. It was only supposed to remain in Earth orbit and yeah, the solid rocket on the end was a little bit too powerful and it flung it off into interplanetary space, which was less than ideal. This time though, the solid rocket has fired up and we are not going anywhere near as far. We remain in Earth's orbit. We don't even reach as far out as the moon. So much better this time round. Now this probe is in its final orbit, we just need to wait 45 days for the experiment to finish. And I do want to say thank you for everyone that left a comment on the last video, letting me know exactly what we are measuring here. So, I have been led to believe, and correct me once again if I am wrong, that Cherenkov radiation is radiation that is emitted when a particle moves through a clear medium such as water faster than the speed of light in that medium. I never studied physics past the age of 16, so when you come to me and leave comments like this on my channel, I find it absolutely fascinating. I love learning about all of this, so please do feel free to keep them coming and educate my uneducated mind. <laughs> it's great. Anyway, in that space center section, which I seem to have brazenly glossed over whilst talking about Cherenkov radiation, and now I'm going to gloss over this launch whilst I talk about that, we built the Garrison Launch Complex. Now, the Garrison Launch Complex is going to be my crude launch complex. With programs and launch complexes, how many times can I say complex in this section? You need to have a crew rated launch complex in order to launch crew. So I had to build an entirely new launch complex in order to launch the Garrison rockets, which are going to be my first crewed vehicles to orbit the Earth. Now I decided that I was gonna gloss over this launch because this is actually just part two of the communications network that I was setting up at the end of the last episode. So we've already seen this get to space once at the end of the last episode, I thought now was probably a good time to maybe talk about what I did miss over that Space Center bit. I did also pick up a magnetometer contract as well as the final radiation contract. And once I complete both of those, I will have completely done the early Earth observational satellites program. And once I've done that, well, I can complete it, freeing me up a administration slot, a program slot. I, I think it's a program slot, which is great because then I can go on and finally pick up the crewed orbit program. That is going to cost me three slots though, and I'm a little ways off of that. So I do also need to finish the commercial satellites program, which is what we are doing right now with this communications network. Once this has been set up, as you can see, it is now performing shakeout testing, which will last two days. I only need to do ammonia orbit. And that shouldn't be too difficult. But as is the case with all of these commercial satellite programs, we lose the satellites. And I have something a little to say about that because I actually want to have something in a Molnia orbit that is going to be useful and just doesn't get given over to the customer. But first, the last mission really that we need to fly for the observational program. And this is going to be MAG-1. This is basically a magnetometer experiment that is going to run in both space high and space low around Earth. Now, this needs to be quite beefy in terms of electric charge because unfortunately, the magnetometer is one of the biggest draws of electric charge of the early science experiments. I think the magnetometer and the TV camera both are a little heinous for taking electric charge from your spacecraft. So I had to put a lot of solar panels on this to ensure that this thing did not run out of electric charge. 
And as was part of the requirements for this contract as well, it did need to go in a very high orbit. So you can see my perigee is 3 million meters above the surface of the Earth and our apogee is 61 million meters, but that is enough to satisfy the orbit requirements. Now, once again, we just need to leave this for 45 days and try and get as much data from it as possible. With that being done, you can see the orbit that I have placed this in, and also we get a very handy little marker that tells me exactly where a Molnir orbit should be. And this is something that I am going to use when attempting to launch the Molnir satellite, because it's pretty useful, basically. That, that's it, it's, it's, it's very handy to have. The garrison complex, though, it's gonna take a little while to build. I should have started this earlier. I should have designed my rocket earlier, but unfortunately, I didn't. And we're gonna have to wait until the end of the year before that's even done, which is a little bit of a shame, because realistically, if I want to be in real life first orbit, I should have started this a little sooner. Being April 1961, we're gonna be quite close. We're currently on the 8th of April 1960, so we've only got a year to beat that milestone. I've come back to the magnetometer satellite because I needed to in order to complete the contract, and I also went back to one of the radiation satellites to finish the contract that that one was attempting to do as well. And with that, I have actually finished all of the early Earth observational contracts, which is great. We are gonna launch another IRAD though, because I still do have some optional contracts which I can complete, and they are gonna give me confidence and funding. Well, confidence and reputation, which in turn gives me funding. Now, the reason why I want confidence is I want to pick up that first crewed orbit contract or program even at breakneck speed. If I pick it up at breakneck speed, I get funds faster and getting funds faster means that I can build things quicker. Unfortunately, IRAD seems to be the most cursed satellite that I have launched. Two of them have failed and this one, I'm fairly sure it was the Gamma 8 that failed, which has never really failed for me before and the rest of the rocket failed to ignite. Somehow it survived splashing down into the ocean though, which was a, a little bit Weird, if you ask me, I would have thought going at those kind of speeds, it definitely would have been completely destroyed. But now, on the 10th of May, we are going to be launching MNET, which is my Molnir network. And I say network, we only need to launch one satellite to fulfill the contract requirements. But as I mentioned previously, I want this to be useful to me once the contract has finished. And in order to get over that, I have put on the payload of this a communications bus, which is what you need in order to fulfill the contract. But on top of that, which is four separate satellites with some solid rocket propellant on them. Yeah, I, I've basically added another four satellites on this. So we're launching five satellites at once here. And the way this contract works, if I release those four satellites that have got yeah, the little solid rocket motors to push them and hopefully it will make them spread out a little bit before the contract completes, then they are not going to get deleted by the game for completing the contract because they will now be separate from the contract. The game will think, oh no, that, that's a different mission. And I can just keep the tiny little communications probe on top of this and I will lose that and not lose these new communication network thing that I've set up and which is great because I did set up a communications network already we've seen one of the launches of it already and it just disappeared which is a real shame and, and that's something I really don't like about PNLC I know the first time that you set up a communications network in old legacy RP1 you got to keep them you don't anymore but there we go I have lost this satellite I've lost this part of the mission and here's me coming back into the tracking station to see do I still have access to these and I do Although, unfortunately, the way I launched them, they weren't exactly facing into the sun, so they are gonna run out of electric charge quite quickly. 
That is a little bit of a problem. Fortunately though, they will still work. I will just have constant blackouts with them because they're not gonna ever fully run out of electric charge because the solar panels are providing enough power to just get enough to keep the probe alive, but they're not gonna have an awful lot. And that is a bit of a shame because it would have been nice to have a proper communications network, especially in Ammonia orbit, which is half a side real day with a very high apogee high up in the northern latitudes of the planet. It basically means that you've got constant coverage in the northern hemisphere which launching from the Cape is going to be very, very useful. But talking of launching from the Cape, we're on to our next one, which is going to be IRAD-5 on the 23rd of May. And hopefully IRAD-5 goes a little bit better than IRAD-4 did. I honestly cannot believe that it was a Gamma engine that failed. They have never failed on me. Not in For All Kerbal Kind, not in this series. They are so reliable. My faith in trusty British engineering seems to have been misguided and they have come round and bitten me where it hurts. But, well, no, it's, it's only happened once. So <laughs> to be honest, I'm still probably going to be using those engines quite a lot. Those engines are incredibly good early game engines and I am very thankful that I have access to them in For All Kerbal Kind because they're brilliant. I use them when I've got every engine available to me because they are just that good. They are fantastic. But IRAD 5 was completely fine and we managed to put it into its orbit. We do have to wait 30 days in order for this contract to complete though, but I mean, what's 30 days over the course of a year? Well, if you ask me, I would tell you it's a month. And we waited a month and there we go, we've completed it already because nothing really happened in between launching that and the contract completing. But what did just happen was I finally finished the Early Earth Observational Program and the Early Earth Commercial Satellites Program, which means that I now have the ability to pick up crude orbit which is fantastic because that gives me so much more money than those two did, especially now that I've picked it up at breakneck speed. And I've picked up Crude Orbit and you might be thinking, but why are you launching another Thunderbolt which looks very similar to the last one that you just launched when you finished those programs? And I will tell you, this has a ScanSat on it and this isn't going to complete any contracts. I just really like how ScanSat looks. I think it's really cool that you can get a very nice map of the Earth in your game and you can check it and you can look at it and you can go and see Brazil if you want to on the map and you're like, wow, I can't believe that's Brazil. Imagine seeing Brazil in Kerbal Space Program. Not everyone can, but when you do, it's absolutely fantastic. Anyway, this got to orbit. I don't know where that tangent was going. <laughs> this got to, this this got to orbit just fine, and it still gains power. So we are going to be getting some lovely maps of the Earth in due course, and of course. Brazil was well, but we're back at the Space Center now, and I have just queued up Shackleton 2 to be built. Now, we launched Shackleton 1 in the last episode, and that was our flyby of Venus. We're going for Mars this time, and I have now come into the Vehicle Assembly Building, where I am working on an upgrade to the Thunderbolt. We've had Thunderbolt 4 for several episodes now, and I thought it needed a little bit of a redesign, a little bit of a, of a glow up, and I think it looks a little bit more modern now, not necessarily completely modern, but it definitely looks a little bit better than the 50s style design that Thunderbolt 4 was. And Thunderbolt 5 was being a little bit problematic whilst I was trying to build it because it just wouldn't let me unlock the tech, even though I had unlocked the tech in research and development. I had to go into the R&D building and basically unlock it from there. And then finally it did allow me to build it, which was fantastic. Now I'm just showing you, I've got up to 1500 total researchers. I am really powering ahead with those. Then it's just picking up advanced capsules era material science before launching the first Thunderbolt 5. And this is gonna be Jester 3 on the 31st of August. The Jester missions have already happened. We've had Jester 1 and Jester 2 a few episodes ago. And basically what they are is sending a satellite to space and then returning it back down to Earth. And I feel like, once again, you're going to be thinking, why on earth are you doing this again? You've done this a couple of times quite a while ago now. You've completed those contracts. Well, it turns out that there is another one of these to do for the crude orbit contract, or the early crude orbit. And I suppose it does make a little bit of sense. If we're going to be sending up crew to space, we want to reliably be able to send them from orbit back down to Earth without them getting toasted like a rather sticky marshmallow. I don't really know what kind of flavor 
toasted Kerbal would be, but I imagine it's not nice. I mean, people think they're made out of plants, so it would be like going into your back garden, finding a tree, ripping off some leaves, and taking a blowtorch to it. Probably wouldn't be the most edible thing ever. Anyway, we are able to send this up to space and do a couple of orbits with it because I do have a new camera experiment on this before firing up the solid rocket boosters on the top of this and sending it back down to Earth. This design was always meant to have the solar panels be ripped off once it entered Earth's atmosphere. I checked that in simulations and it worked perfectly fine. It didn't cause any worrying tipping whilst it was coming down through the atmosphere. With that safely landed, I gained a fair bit of science and also completed the contract. And this is when I decided to come and crew rate the Thunderbolt launch complex because one of the contracts for the first crewed orbit is actually sending something akin to Mercury Redstone. Go on a suborbital hop, which is definitely something that I am going to be doing. And I figured out that Thunderbolt is more than capable of doing that. I did also just train up George and Thierry in their first mission for the Mercury capsule. And one thing I didn't mention earlier is that George's retirement date has actually passed. Originally, she was due to retire in June 1960. And the training that I did for the Mercury capsule pushed her past that training date. However, because she was in training, she couldn't retire, and as soon as she finished that training, her retirement date got pushed back, which means I still have her, and I still have her for quite some time. It definitely does mean that I will hopefully be able to achieve first orbit with her. Anyway, I have completely glossed over the fact that we are launching Shackleton 2, which is going to be our first attempt at flying past Mars. I don't really have the technology, unfortunately, to get a Mars orbit yet, that will have to wait until the next Mars transfer window because it does take quite a bit more that unfortunately the Odyssey really isn't going to be capable of until I unlock Hydrolox engines. As soon as I have those, then I almost certainly can do Mars and Venus orbits on top of an Odyssey. But we did get the Odyssey safely up to orbit. Nothing went wrong with this launch in the slightest. And now it's time to turn to my good friend Noodle Sim Simulator, because yes, that's what Principia is. You just make noodles all over the solar system and hope that one of them sticks and sends you on a nice flyby of Mars, which is exactly what I am getting here. And the reason how I'm able to plot out this flyby quite quickly using Principia when you're just given numbers and you think, oh my God, what on earth am I gonna be doing is I put in the Delta V tangent box, the amount of Delta V that it requires me to fly to Mars as provided by the transfer window planner mod. It tells me exactly how much I'm going to need I put that in and then I move my maneuver to the night side of Earth because I know that's roughly where my maneuver is going to be when I start my burn. And then I just fine tune it looking at Mars until I get the encounter as close as I possibly can. But we have fired up a new engine on this and this is actually using liquid fluorine. It's a fuel that I've never used before because I'm fairly sure in previous runs that I have done of RP1, I have not had access to this technology, but it is incredibly efficient and it's probably the best engine that I had for this job at the moment until I unlock Hydrolox later on. I do have to do a little bit of a course correction using the RCS on the probe. Oh my God, this isn't a science core probe. No, we've actually got deep space avionics for this. I have control over this the entire way to Mars. But with that on its way to Mars, unfortunately, it's not going to arrive there until next year, which means we won't be seeing that until next episode. Now, I did just pick up the Mars flyby contract because that contract is one that you can pick up that doesn't require you to launch a new vessel. This is absolutely fantastic because it means you can guarantee the contract will complete before you even pick it up. However, in other news, I have now unlocked all of the Mercury parts and built the first garrison test vehicle, which which is going to be on top of the Thunderbolt. And in order to get that out this year, as well as the next Spark mission, which is going to be our return to lunar operations, I have to spend a bit of time faffing around with the engineers tab and the staffing tab in particular, trying to make sure that both of those complexes are going to get these rockets out. Now, I probably shouldn't have done this and I really should have just really focused on the garrison complex, which is what I'm putting engineers into right now. It has been finished and that is going to be the one that actually takes our crew to orbit. But I wanted to have those two flights out by the end of the year because it's content, really. I, I did it so that I could fit it into this video. Ideally, I probably would have just focused on the garrison one so I can get the crewed orbit done faster 
but I didn't do that because I wanted to have two extra launches over this episode and this does mean that I am pushing back the Garrison Orbital launch a little bit further and that means that that milestone of trying to beat the in real life orbit is, is slipping through my fingers. It's there, it's like sand. Suddenly, there's nothing there, it's, it's gone and Yuri Gagarin is pointing at me from, from the moon and laughing. <laughs> well, he never went to the moon, but you know, uh, Rip Yuri Gagarin obviously died in a plane accident. Very sad. Anyway, we are going to now be launching Spark 7 with all of that aside. But really, I don't know where this voiceover has gone over the course of this episode. It's been a little bit all over the place. Spark 7 is going to be my first attempt at trying to land something on the surface of the moon. Well, I say land something, soft land something, because technically an impactor is landing something, and we have done several of those already. Now, the reason why I'm able to use the Odyssey vehicle to do this lunar landing mission, whereas previously I wouldn't have been able to, is that it has had a bit of an upgrade. So, it previously used the LR91. I have swapped that out for the X405. I believe it's the X405, which is a slightly more efficient engine once you get to the upper stages. It's a little bit better in vacuum, and it also has three ignitions as well, which is perfect. And as well as that, to get to the moon, I'm once again turning to the liquid fluorine engine, which is the G1, and this is much more efficient than any other engine I have unlocked at the moment. And to get a lunar landing, I'm going to do the old tried and tested way of being unguided. It's going to be an unguided lunar landing, so we are going to point straight at the moon, try and smack it, send it on an impact course, and once we arrive at the moon, I'm going to burn like nothing and try and slow myself down. And then finally, the top stage does have deep space avionics, which will suddenly spring to life. And I'll be able to control that and hopefully soft land it down on the surface. And that would be the idea if the probe didn't decide to really randomly spin all over the place in directions I did not think possible. I don't know what is going on here. I spin stabilized it when I was at Earth, which is why it's spinning. But the entire thing just span in different directions and I thought maybe this is a bit of a bug. I'll go to the tracking station and I will return to the spacecraft once we get a little bit closer to the moon. But alas, no. It still was spinning completely the wrong way and I didn't even bother firing up the engine again because I just was pointing in completely the wrong direction. But yet, somehow, mysteriously, when we hit the moon, the entire thing doesn't break. Part of it survives. And not only that, it comes to a stop on the surface. However, I did lose the antenna, which means we can't communicate back to Earth. That means I can't complete the contract. But now it's time for the dawn of human spaceflight. But we are going to be taking the human out because, um, well, Kerbal out. But on the 21st of December 1960, we are going to be launching the Garrison Test Vehicle. And the reason why I've taken the Kerbal out is the contract requires me to launch an uncrewed version of this mission first. Unfortunately, we can't stick George or Thierry in here. They're not going to go suborbital yet. Although, actually, both of them have been suborbital in the x planes program earlier on in this series. And the Garrison test vehicle performs flawlessly. Nothing goes wrong with it. It's a thunderbolt. I have used this vessel so many times. If this were to fail, I would be very shocked considering it's using some very reliable engines. And that is something that I do quite want to do over the course of this series is when it comes to crewed launches. And now that we are really at the point where crewed launches are going to be becoming a thing, I don't want to stick them on a tried or on, on an untried design. I want to make sure that every engine that they have on their vessel is very unlikely to fail because that's where crew death comes from. And I don't want to be killing anyone at all if I can help it. And that would be a great goal for the a big thanks to KC, CDR San, Opus, Redstone Wizard, Shadow Dev, Y Mandarin, Darth Malakor, Mr. Blue Star, Rail Cowgirl, Ryan Miller, and the rest of my patrons and members for their continued support. I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later. Like I said on the thumbnail, they are pioneers. They don't know what they're getting into. Anything can happen. But we are able to complete the contract, which is fantastic. And that means that I can pick up suborbital flight crewed. But unfortunately, we do find ourselves at the end of 1960, which means that these are...
vehicle is going to be finished on the 17th of February. That is a couple of months before the historical date. However, I have to launch it uncrewed first. I mean, I could stick a Kerbal in there and beat Gagarin's time by a couple of months. Easy! But it won't fulfill the contract and that's something that I really want to do. And even sticking all 710 of my engineers into the garrison complex, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to build and launch one in just two months. A big thanks to KC, CDR San, Opus, Redstone Wizard, Shadow Dev, Y Mandarin, Chris Morrison, Darth Malakor, Mr. Blue Star, Rail Cowgirl, Ryan Miller, and the rest of my patrons and members for their continued support. I have been Karnassa, and I will see you later.